I said, well, can we collect the documents today? We said, sure, come on in. They said, can we call in a few other FBI agents to help us make all these photocopies? We said, sure. About 25 FBI agents show up at our office in about an hour, and then television cameras come. The local CBS, NBC, and ABC affiliates from Los Angeles show up, reporting that our office was being raided by the FBI. Good evening, everybody, and I can tell you, yes, I have lost a lot of money, and my wife was really upset <laughs> after many years of sacrifice. So I appreciate Joe's uh, uh, invitation to come and speak. Let's give Joe and the team that organized this a big round of applause. <laughs> it's a great event. I look forward to meeting many of you and hopefully following up even after this event, because uh, I think there'll be great opportunities to collaborate. So the title of my remarks tonight are What on Earth Happened to Prove Biosciences? But let me tell you a little bit about what we'll be discussing tonight. I'll tell you a little bit about me, so I'll introduce myself. A little about Profound Ventures, uh, which is the early stage uh, venture group that I currently lead. Uh, a little bit about Prove Biosciences, which is the tragic story after the seven years of success that I'll be giving you some details and some insights on tonight. Oh, thank you. I needed that probably uh, a year and a half ago. Um, and then a little bit about what we achieved, where we were in December 2016, and then what happened next, and then where do you kind of go from there. So to that end, a little bit about me. I've been married, still married after this experience, uh, which is a remarkable achievement, uh, for over 19 years to my best friend, Catherine. Uh, we just celebrated our 19th anniversary. She's a lawyer uh, and a law professor at Chapman. We have three great kids. Uh, they were ones that sacrificed a lot of time away from dad as we were building the company. And we are very religiously devout. Um, I'm an idealist, even after going through the crap that I went through. I'm an activist in the community, uh, volunteer with a lot of things, do a lot of youth coaching. I've um, been a PTA president, and I've even been a former publicly elected official, and I can tell you what I went through was far worse than anything I ever saw in politics. Um, and my background professionally, um, I have been an executive and a social entrepreneur in healthcare for about 20 years. Um, I've been the emerging company CEO of the year up in Orange County, won lots of different awards for things. Uh, I spent my career either in pharmaceuticals or diagnostics at Eli Lilly and Johnson & Johnson, uh, engaged in digital health before it was called digital health uh, 20 years ago, um, and then was at Prometheus Laboratories, which is where I cut my teeth on diagnostics here in San Diego, and then founded Prove Biosciences. So, with that uh, introduction, let me just tell you a little bit about what I'm doing now. Uh, we have an early stage seed fund uh, called Profound Ventures. We are minor league investors in the sense of we invest small amounts of money. Uh, we look for opportunities where we can act as operating partners to really help grow ventures. Uh, my partners in this include uh, my former chief legal officer at Prove, uh, Laura Hunter, who was the head of Brobex, uh, co-chair of their life science practice internationally. He's done over 75 IPOs, raised over $2 billion. Dr. Felix Fru, who was the head of genomics uh, at FDA, was Craig Venter's founding CSO here at Human Longevity and was the president of the R&D division for Medco before Express Scripts bought them. He's a scientist on our team. And Khan Nguyen, who was my chief technology officer at Proof, he's the technologist on our team. A little bit about our portfolio. Uh, we have several different ventures. Uh, we have a network of hospital partner laboratories and Revnostics Group. Uh, IMCS Group, which is the nation's largest network of uh, behavioral health care uh, therapists in all 50 states, over 1,000 therapists uh, providing support in the workers' comp business. Flint Rehab, which is up in Irvine, uh, which is an at-home, FDA-cleared platform of medical devices for stroke recovery. Uh, Seraltum is a new one that we just started. It's a spin out of the DARPA subnets initiative uh, with a brain computer interface, both external device and internal device. It has a 510K pathway as well as an IDE pathway. Uh, we acquired National Toxicology, which is uh, the oldest toxicology laboratory in the United States. Uh, two gentlemen in their 80s were pioneers in the toxicology business, built the U.S. Army's toxicology network of laboratories, and then an associated company, Benefit Health. Uh, the Brain Park, which is an initiative out of the Society for Brain Mapping and Therapeutics, and we have two plays in the aging space. Um, everything that we look at is we look at technologies or business models that help solve profound societal problems. Uh, that's something core to the mission uh, that we are trying to do. And we're currently fairly overwhelmed with what we have, but we're always open to new opportunities for collaboration. Okay, so what on earth happened to prove biosciences? You know, many rockets will blow up on the launch pad. Uh, very few blow up far up into the sky like the Challenger uh, space shuttle image that I have here. Uh, Prove Biosciences was not like a startup uh, that dies in its first year or two or three, um, but died eight years uh, after its founding. And so a little bit about Prove Biosciences. I started the company in December 2009. Its mission basically was to deliver on the promise of precision medicine in the world's largest and most expensive health condition, which is chronic pain, bigger than cancer, diabetes, and heart disease combined. Um, we did a lot of great things um, and were able to achieve a lot. And everyone that was involved with our organization understood our mission. And so speed up now, seven years to December 2016. Let me tell you where we were. 
uh, right before the destruction happened. We were 278 full-time employees. We occupied those two buildings uh, right there in Irvine Spectrum. We had a 60,000 square foot campus. We operated a CLIA and CAP accredited laboratory. Uh, we, in 2016 alone, uh, delivered, physicians ordered over 354,000 different genetic panels. We had 28 million in cash collected revenue, a little over a million in cash EBITDA. We had made the Inc. 500 list a couple years in a row. We were number 16 on the Deloitte Technology Fast 500, one of the fastest growing technology companies in all of North America. We had built the world's largest and highest quality DNA biobank and big data clinic, clinical genetic database in chronic pain with 153,000 patients where we had characterized the DNA and had prospective data that we collected under IRB uh, out six to 12 months on all of those patients. The next closest was Sean Mackey's database up at Stanford called Choir that your taxpayer dollar spent $10 million to build, which had about 15,000 employees and, or 15,000 patients and no genetic information. Uh, we had 15 different panels on the market. We had lots of great research collaborations, won tons of awards from various different medical societies, had presented a lot of posters, had many peer-reviewed publications, had great relationships with the top brass at CMS, including the chief medical officer, Kate Goodrich and her deputy, Chris Cox, the chief data officer and her deputy, um, and others at NIH, a really strong board of directors, externally audited financials, and we were preparing to file our S1. We're in the midst of raising a mezzanine crossover round and getting ready for an IPO. So things sound pretty good for where we were sitting. And after you know, seven and a half, eight years of sacrificing time away from my kids, pretty stoked uh, with where we were at the time. All right, then we were victimized by something that I didn't really understand at the time. So Oxford English Dictionary is, if you will, an authoritative source on the English language, and language oftentimes reflects culture. Well, three years ago, the dictionary chose as its word of the year, post-truth, meaning that as, an, as a society speaking English, we don't value truth as much as we did anymore, as we used to. Then two years ago, it chose fake news as the word of the year. And last year, the word was misinformation. When you put those three words together, there's a trend that's happening in society around lies and their pervasiveness. Well, we were victimized by fake news and some corporate espionage. Warren Buffett said once uh, that it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. And it was quite a fall from grace uh, to go from being listed in the newspapers as one of five earthly angels to then being the CEO of a company uh, that was considered corrupt based on some of the media coverage. We basically had three disgruntled uh, former employees, actually two employees and one consultant, um, who were trying to compete uh, with us. We had all of their emails because they stupidly accessed it while they were employed, their personal emails in our Citrix environment. Um, but we knew what their intentions were. We terminated them and trying to be nice guys and not sue them and make their lives miserable because they didn't have any money. We just let them go. But they ended up filing a whistleblower lawsuit against us about six months after their termination. Well, they didn't have any evidence to back it up, so the government didn't take it. It took them about a year to make that determination. So they then went to a website called muckrack.com, which you can go to and you can see a listing of all these would-be journalists, bloggers, uh, that dig into the mud on things. And they shopped it around. They were able to find a gentleman by the name of Charles Piller, who at the time was writing for Stat News. He had been fired from the, uh, the Los Angeles Times and sold him on their story. And so this reporter, Charles Piller, uh, reached out to me on the Friday before um, of Thanksgiving that year with a bunch of ridiculous questions. Uh, we gave him uh, all the primary sources and he chose to ignore them. And this was his first article which published at the uh, end of December and then he published a second article uh, which was over the top uh, in February of 2017. Um, to give you a sense, um, he completely ignored primary sources that he was given took quotes completely out of context, and even invented documents. So if you were to pull up on your phone right now, pull up your Safari browser or your Google Chrome browser, and you type in any company's name, and then you click on the little images hyperlink, what'll likely happen is you'll see a bunch of logos for a particular company. Anybody can pull down the logo of a company and put it on a Word document. And that's exactly what this reporter did uh, to create sources uh, for what he was alleging. So, the dangers of a one-sided story. So this image right here, if you are someone like uh, the, the individual who wrote this article, you may say Prince William gives onlookers a rude gesture by looking at that image, a one-sided story. Now, if you look at the exact same picture from a different angle, it's a very different view. A professional journalist, a real investigative reporter, would maybe look at different sides of an issue to try to understand and maybe substantiate some of the allegations uh, that were stated. And so a professional journalist would write, well, Prince William holds up the number three which would be very different than the previous image. So whether you like Prince William or the royal family or not would likely define how you interpret that photo, which is something called confirmation bias. Oftentimes, people will interpret and understand things based upon their preconceived notions. 
So what happened with us? Well, the first thing this reporter did after he heard Bruce Gardner and John Hubbard's accusations is he then went to some third party sources, credible folks, and gave them the accusations and said, what do you think of this? So for example, one of those accusations was that we had a pure genetic test to predict addiction, which is not true. Um, but he took it to someone and said, do you think there can be a pure genetic test for addiction? And the person said, no, I think that's hogwash, which ended up being his first, uh, his first title uh, on his first article. And so then he was able to take that quote and say that this particular expert thinks that proofs technology is hogwash. It's not what was said, but that's what was, what was, uh, what was used. Uh, he then took a quote from a key opinion leader who was on a medical advisory board and also misplaced that. He grabbed some former uh, employee opinions who had been fired. He took some things from billing practices completely out of context, research practices, and the fact that one of our ordering clinicians over the previous seven years had invest and been investigated by the DEA for some opioid prescribing behaviors, and one of our employees was interviewed as part of the government investigation of that doctor that then became that our employees were now investigated by or interviewed by the FBI. So he would share the misinformation with experts to get their reaction to the falsehood. He would then quote their reaction to the false information as an opinion of the company, and then voila. He had a credible quote allegedly about the company to provide him plausible deniability about fake news, which then protects his freedom of speech to lie. And that's a tactic that's oftentimes used in the media. So what were some of those lies? Well, the bias was laboratory developed tests are not credible because they're not approved by the FDA. For those that don't know, there is a whole cadre of laboratory tests. In fact, most genetic tests that are on the market today are not approved by the FDA. They fall under laboratory developed tests, uh, including genomic health tests, a lot of myriads tests, et cetera. So with that bias, his lie was there was no scientific evidence supporting our testing and that we were using a loophole in federal law to exploit the system because our tests were laboratory developed tests. Where the truth was we had extensive published scientific evidence um, we had clinical validity papers, clinical utility papers, and in fact, when we met with the folks with CMS, they said they'd never seen an LDT have that type of data because we could sit down with CMS with 54,326 patients and we could show that we had saved them billions of dollars uh, by pulling the data from the University of Minnesota. So the truth was very different than the bias or the lies. Um, he suggested, you know, laboratories that were involved in pain and addiction were usually involved in some type of scheme like kickbacks and those type of things. And so the allegation was we paid docs to order tests. Well, that wasn't true at all either. Uh, he used a fraudulent source document where basically someone had pulled down our logo from the internet and created a completely false document. The reality was our research were all involved with IRB approved studies, listed on clinicaltrials.gov, approved by many leading institutions like MD Anderson, USC, and others, and no doctor was ever paid or financially induced to order testing. But you could say that if you have a research contract with USC, maybe the reason why you're doing that is to hopefully hope that at some point in time in the future they're going to order testing. I think that's a little bit of a stretch, but that was, that was his approach. Another bias was that laboratories are corrupt and any successful lab must be like Theranos. He was, he was big on this Theranos kick. And so he suggested that our research was a sham when obviously the truth was very different than that. And then he suggested our billing practices were corrupt. Uh, somehow we were engaging in Medicare fraud when the reality was the coding we had approved by CMS in writing on four different occasions directly with the folks in Woodlawn. We actually underbilled CMS because I'm very conservative about things and our technology was supported by the top brass at CMS. So then what did we do about this? So we had these attacks coming in. They started coming in right before Christmas in December with the first article. Then it was right after Valentine's Day in February 2017. And so we consulted legal counsel. Legal counsel's recommendation was, oh, don't respond. It makes you look defensive. You know, that we, they went ahead, our legal counsel reached out to the U.S. Attorney's Office down here in the Southern District in San Diego and the Central District up in Los Angeles, reached out to the people in the Northern District of Kentucky, which is where that doctor had been investigated, reached out to people in D.C., et cetera. They said, nope, there's no investigation of proof. Um, and they shared with me something that I came to learn, that if you are an entrepreneur, a college professor, a CEO of a company, whatever it is, if you are mentioned in the newspaper or in any form of media online, social media, as an expert in your field, because I'd been on the cover of newspapers and CNBC and all this type of stuff, you were then considered something called a limited purpose public figure, which under a Supreme Court case, New York Times v. Sullivan, means that slander and libel laws or defamation laws do not protect you. It's one of the reasons why in politics they can say whatever they want to about you and destroy you and you can't sue them for it. Those are public figures. Limited purpose public figures would be like the NCAA coaches that were allegedly investigated by the FBI but they had nothing on them and some of them lost their jobs. Um, it's because of that law that allows that to happen which is a huge, huge risk. 
Our board of directors' recommendation was, the quote that I kept getting thrown out to me was, never pick a fight with people who buy ink by the barrel, which was a Mark Twain quote. And they said, you know, we've been around for a long time. You know, we had the former Secretary of Health and Human Services on our board, the former head of EY's life science practice, uh, the former president of uh, Advanced PCS, who was an executive with Lilly, the head of compliance at Cancer Treatment Centers of America. And they were like, ah, we've been around this for a long time. You're doing all the right things. Take the high road. Mistake. Huge, huge, huge mistake. In the world where negative information spreads much faster than positive information, where people can overreact, where in the legal system it's guilty or innocent till proven guilty, in the court of public opinion it's guilty till proven innocent. So it's the inverse. I was scared and inexperienced. Didn't know. Honestly, you know, you hear that phrase, too big to fail kind of thing. I really thought we were too big to fail. There's, ah, there's no way people will believe this garbage. Um, and so I listened to the advice of legal counsel and what I thought was an all-star board of directors, and we didn't sue Stat News, we didn't sue Charles Pillar, we just said, no, we're just gonna keep going the high road and everything is gonna be fine. And boy, was that a huge mistake. So the situation went from bad to worse. In May of 2017, I get a phone call from our HIPAA counsel at Sidley Austin in Washington, D.C., and she goes, Brian, do you know there's been a whistleblower lawsuit filed against proof? And I said, no, but I'm not surprised after these Pillar articles that something's been done. I gave you, obviously, some insights before we knew it. And so, accidentally, the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Central District of California accidentally put sealed documents on a federal database that I was unaware of, because I'd never been involved in lawsuits like this beforehand, called PACER, which is a public database of court filings. And it accidentally leaked these documents. Um, hadn't been unsealed, um, but they did it. And so we found out about it, and our lawyers found out about it. And so we said, okay, well, let's see if the government will fix it. And it took them a couple days, and they didn't. So we went ahead and reached out to those U.S. attorney's offices down here and up in Los Angeles and just said, hey, guys, we've got this reporter who really hates our guts. Um, you guys accidentally somehow must have leaked this. Could you please reseal it because everything's marked sealed. There's been no court order to unseal it. We really want, don't want this guy to find out about it because it's going to be another nasty article. And they were like, oh, my gosh, how did you guys find out about this? It's not supposed to be unsealed. We're like, yeah, we understand that. Can you please do it? So the letters went back and forth though, from Memorial Day weekend. Um, and we complied and did all that type of stuff. Um, and within a week, we came to learn that down here in San Diego, uh, at the U.S. Attorney's Office, they had convened a grand jury in the court down here to investigate all the big genetic testing companies. Myriad Genetics up in Salt Lake had received a subpoena. Genomic Health and Terra up in Silicon Valley had received a subpoena. Genome DX and Biotheranostics down here in San Diego had received subpoenas. And by virtue of the awful allegations that were made about Prove in the Charles Pillar articles, June 7, 2017, an FBI agent shows up at our office about 7.06 a.m. in the morning and hands us a subpoena for documents. I was driving up with time, my 10-year-old son to the office, and I turned around and went right back home because I wasn't gonna involve William uh, in that. We were obviously very cooperative. We said, sure, we're happy to provide you whatever you'd like. They said, well, can we collect the documents today? We said, sure, come on in. They said, can we call in a few other FBI agents to help us make all these photocopies? We said, sure, about 25 FBI agents show up at our office in about an hour, and then television cameras come. The local CBS, NBC, and ABC affiliates from Los Angeles show up, reporting that our office was being raided by the FBI. A raid usually involves breaking a door down, an arrest, a charge of wrongdoing. These guys bought Papa John's pizza for everybody. They were very, very nice, very professional. Went through the list of everything, and we gave them boxes and boxes of photocopies of stuff. But Charles Pillar was very happy to publish that article that the FBI raids the offices of the lab that pays doctors to promote genetic tests, which was his victory dance to suggest that we had done something wrong. The media reports were awful. Um, within 60 days of this happening, um, CMS notified us and shut us off. Said we have to put you on hold during the inquiry. United Healthcare shut us off. Um, it was a disaster. We went from the previous month 2.5 million in monthly revenue by July 187,000. We had a 93% reduction in revenue within 60 days. So where were we uh, 90 days after the subpoena for documents, seven months after the second uh, pillar hit piece? 90% reduction in revenue. Medicare, as we talked about, shut us off, as well as United, uh, which were our two largest payers. We had ordering clinicians that were spooked once the quote-unquote FBI raid happened on the same day that they showed up with us. They showed up at nine of our doctor's offices in the Midwest and the Pacific Northwest asking questions. Um, as senior management, we stopped taking pay, the VP and C level, and ultimately within 60 days, we had to fire almost all of our employees. Um, we were 278 beforehand, we were less than five. We couldn't cut costs Fast enough, we built up an accounts payable, about $3 million, and it was a disaster, an absolute disaster. All the stuff that we had talked about could never happen, happened. 
Um, ultimately, in August, we put the company into something called a receivership, which was a way to avoid a bankruptcy, at least that's what we were advised on, to restructure. Ultimately, that ended up being another huge mistake. Don't ever do it if anyone tells you to. Um, I had funded the company myself for the most part. I own 96% of the outstanding shares, 73% fully diluted with the employee option pool. But once we appointed the receiver, the receiver was in complete control of everything. And after two weeks, he decided, no, I think we're just gonna liquidate the assets instead of the restructuring plan that we initially agreed to when he was appointed. And so in a matter of a couple months, September 30th, he shut down operations, turned over our buildings to the Irvine company, told customers to stop ordering and shut the business down completely. So that by December 2019, um, or I'm sorry, 2017, eight years after founding the company, the company shuttered. Really crappy situation. So what was the result of the inquiry? A lot of other folks had to pay fines. Natera, big publicly traded company, had to pay 11.4 million. Myriad had to pay. Genome DX down here had to pay almost 2 million. A lot of different companies had to pay uh, fines because they did something wrong. We had the autopsy without the benefit of death. We had whatever you want to call it. The you know, rectal exam with steel wool. They went through everything they could think of. We came down here in San Diego and sat down with this young AUSA who had no healthcare experience who was leading us. Um, and you know, all the different scary threats and all that type of stuff. Um, but I was confident. I was confident what we did because I knew everything that we did was, was above board. And so the government inquiry resulted in no allegations of wrongdoing or charges, no fines, not even one single dollar of a clawback to CMS. Not even one because we actually were underbilling, so they actually owed us money. Um, and there were no indictments, no arrests. So unfortunately, the only technology that's in the, uh, clinically proven in the peer-reviewed literature to help solve the opioid abuse crisis by being able to predict opioid addiction with 96.7% accuracy and help reduce pain was pulled off the market. Stat News got tons of advertising revenue and Pillar even got a new job. So where do you go from here? All right, that was kind of a bummer story, wasn't it? But, well, you take the lessons you learned from the tragedy and you try to find meaning in it. Uh, you try to help others avoid the pain you went through. So I throw up this orange over here for a second um, because I've spoken to different groups beforehand. You know, when most of us, I'm sure all of us at some point in time in our kitchens have had something like this emerge. Maybe we were traveling a bunch and there were some oranges that we left and started to develop some fungus. And when most of us see something like that, our reaction would be, ew. It's not particularly appealing. Not something that we, appealing, pun not intended, but um, uh, appealing in the sense of wanting to eat it, right? However, back in 1928, Alexander Fleming, looked at something that had been thrown away in the trash, something that most people would consider a disappointment, and looked at it in a different way. Instead of looking at it and saying, yuck, he looked at it and said, hmm. And by virtue of that, was able to discover something that was able to save millions, if not billions of lives, because up until 1928, the greatest cause of death in the world was infection. One every three of us wouldn't have survived to adulthood without antibiotics, and by virtue of that, he was able to discover penicillin. Again, a tragic image that inspired something to do good. And I think that that's an important lesson to learn. That, that very awkward picture of me there in the middle is when I was 13 years of age. This was a lesson that I learned actually when I was young and having to deal with tragedy. It's one of the reasons, I guess, why through my faith I've been able to deal with this particular situation. When I was 13 years of age, a good friend of mine named Chris Kelly was killed when he was riding his bike in front of my house, over, uh, in front of my house coming over to my home. And I was one of the first people on the scene and it was one of those things that gets you over that Superman complex that you have, that invincibility idea that you have as a teenager, pretty quickly. And I wanted to do something to give something that was so incredibly unjust and unfair meaning. At the time, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. Instead, I just married one. But at the time, I was interested in the law. And so I led an effort when I was 13 years of age to pass the very first bicycle helmet law for children in the United States back in Maryland where I grew up. And during that time, it was pre-internet, obviously, um, I got contacted by this gentleman who I'd only seen on TV, Dr. C. Everett Koop, who was the former Surgeon General of the United States, who was creating a nonprofit organization called the National Safe Kids Campaign out of Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C. And they wanted me to volunteer and help build this nonprofit, which I did throughout my high school years. And we passed over 300 similar laws across the United States. And I learned from that experience that you can take something that's an awful situation, tragic, unjust, and you can find meaning in it to be able to help others and to be able to make a difference in the world, rather than just wallowing in the anger or the frustration, because crap happens to everybody. It's kind of what we signed up for coming down here to Earth. Uh, it's an awful situation that all of us have to go through, whether it's health challenges, financial challenges, family issues, whatever it is, we're all gonna deal with our crap. The question is, how do we handle it? And can we help others by virtue of what we go through? And so that's a picture of me and my kids when they were young um, with, uh, with something that we did with, uh, with bicycle helmets to be able to help others. Actually, I think it was the 20th anniversary of the law. Uh, we had that picture taken back in Maryland. The other aspect is that you finish the mission you started. That's a picture of my wife and kids now, a lot older. 
Um, a lot of their childhood was spent dad working at Prove and building it up. But you finished the mission you started. Uh, Prove did a lot of great things. You know, I was a keynote speaker at the National Institute of Drug Abuse on big data and personalized medicine and dealing with addiction. Um, very good friends with a lot of the key opinion leaders in the field. And the mission got derailed by virtue of some people that lied, that made money on spreading the lie, good people in the government that overreacted, did their job, but ended up destroying a company in the process. And so you gotta figure out a way to finish that mission. And so obviously with the things that we're doing with Profound right now, we're looking at ways to be able to pick up the pieces of the technology that was left, a lot of the data that's published, a lot of the things that can be done. We've rebuilt the software. Um, and we've got a new venture coming out to basically be able to address that because all of the key opinion leaders want us to do so. And so when you're going through a difficult situation, and all of us will deal with it, hopefully you'll never have to go through something like this. I pray that you won't. I hope that as you deal with the challenges that you deal with, which we all will, that's one thing you can't be spared of, that you'll be able to find meaning and purpose in some of those difficult things, whether it's an early stage company, whether it's a professional challenge in your work, personal challenge, whatever it may be, and find a way to be able to help others. Draw strength from that, gain empathy and compassion, and be able to help others that may be going through similar things or prevent others from having to deal with the tragedy that you deal with. I am writing a book on the Prove Experience. There's a lot of things I learned about the nuances of having to deal with this and this new reputation threat that's emerged in this post-truth, fake news, and misinformation world that we live in now. And hopefully that'll be able to help some executives and some entrepreneurs, coaches, athletes, and others uh, that are mentioned in the media because their lives are at risk in light of the world we live in. So I'll be around during the reception. Look forward to getting to know you guys better. Thank you so much for your attention. Hopefully I didn't bore you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present. Well, don't go anywhere. This is the question part. My first question now is, are you a hugger? Am I a hugger? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm really um, I'm moved by your faith and, and what you've done with, no, keep the nice pictures of him up. Um, and uh, making the best of a really crappy situation. And... I'm sure I'm not alone when you feel this indignation of, but that's so unfair. Yes, it is. And as I tell my Lucas, life's not fair, son. And it's painful for a 15-year-old, and it's painful for well, however old you are. Um, as a marketer, mm -hmm. I can't help but think to myself that you could have a rebirth. And, you know, Brian proves them wrong. <laughs> Yeah, the and, title of the book is going to be called Prove It. Yeah, but, but yes. And, I, I, you know, unfortunately, my friend Laura uh, Nobles is not here in the room tonight. You probably know her. I know Laura very well. Okay. Um, I think it's as, as even odds as anything to say, hey, everybody, remember that guy? Well, he was found completely innocent. And, and the way, I mean, personally, I was moved by your presentation tonight. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I'm willing to bet that at least five others were. Um, and if we could tell that story through many different media now about why your product, which was the only one that did this thing, was derailed by misinformation and badness, there's really, to, in my mind, no reason not to come back. But you're, I'm sure this is not the first time you thought of that. Absolutely. So one of, one of the companies that we've funded with Profound is called Benefit Health. Um, but we've spelled it B-E-N-N-U-F-I-T. The Bennu bird was the Egyptian firebird that preceded the Greek phoenix rising from the ashes. And so with Benefit Health, what we've basically done is we've rebuilt the technology as a software that we can then license to laboratories. And then we're going to we bought National Talks so we can actually put it into a laboratory as well. Um, and then Felix, because he's so intimately familiar with uh, genetic testing at the FDA, since one of the challenges was, well, this is not FDA approved. Um, and so we're, we've already started talks with the FDA and that type of thing to say, okay, we'll just 510K it and then take it out that way. But, um, but without a doubt, we're gonna finish the mission. There's a lot to be done in pain. Um, if you've ever, unfortunately with behavioral health in general, um, there is a stigma. And it's not just in American society, it's in most of Western Europe, it's in Latin American culture, it's in Asian culture, et cetera. If someone has cancer, they're a victim. But if someone has a behavioral health issue, whether it's chronic pain, depression, anxiety, people think there's something wrong with them. There's a measure of blame that's apportioned to them, which is unfortunate um, because chronic pain is a neurological condition. And for those people that have it, um, it's miserable, it's ubiquitous. In fact, the government's overreaction to the opioid abuse epidemic, which has basically been to torture chronic pain patients by denying them the medications they need, like everything the government does, has a law of unintended consequences, has now resulted in the fact that 10% of all suicides in the United States are now due to chronic pain because people just kill themselves. Mm -hmm 
because it's so bad. And so there is a there is a, an absolute need to help these patients, to help these doctors, um, and that's why I continue to work with the key opinion leaders in the field, the different presidents of the medical societies, and those type of things, to give it a rebirth. I just have to be careful um, because I know there'll be people that'll be gunning for me, um, just by virtue of there were some enemies that were made in the proof process. That led to the misinformation. Yeah. Absolutely. So they'll try again. They of haven't course. gone away. Of course. You know, bully is still a bully. But that's right. Now at least you have a story that's reinforced. So I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you have a question. My next question is, when you put the company in receivership, do you have any ownership over the IP now? Great question. So it's all locked in the receivership. So literally, the biobank, for example, that we had, the 153,000 DNA specimens and all that data, the receiver didn't think there was any value in it and just destroyed it. Smart. Didn't even sell the CLIA license, just turned it back over. I was like, well, are you an idiot? Um, and so I, I you know, got lawyers and filed things in court and all this type of stuff, but receiverships are a bad idea, don't do them. Because they're like God, uh, and they can be a really dumb God, um, and, and make some really, really dumb dumb decisions. Which is unfortunate, because I look back on it, like, gosh, we spent $20 million building that biobank and all of that data. I owned, at the time, 100% of the company. I mean, I could have put that in my pocket if I thought someone was going to trash it. Um, but we were doing it for the common good because we wanted to share it with the researchers and do some crowdsourcing innovation and that type of stuff. But it all got derailed, so it is what it is. I could do this all day, but <laughs> question. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Ahmed. Uh, I'm Ahmed, a nice biomedical to meet you. engineer uh, from New York. Uh, so my question is basically, so now that you're founding with a new company, it seems that I know you did everything uh, in the first time based on all the rules and everything. Yeah. So do you now think that every time you do something, you will think, oh, I'm, n I'm not just going to do the minimum required. I I'm going to go do beyond that just in case something else comes up in the future? Yeah, great question. So we actually did do way beyond the minimum required. Um, the challenge that I realized was, you know, when I grew up, I'm sure your parents were the same way. I remember my mom telling me, everything that you do and say and write, make sure it can be on the cover of the New York Times and you're fine. So I've lived by that. No, I'm good with that. I mean, we even sat down with the U.S. Attorney. I said, I hope you have wiretapped every single phone call I've had since the beginning of Prove. Go through every single email. You can come to my house if you want to. You're not going to find anything. The challenge is, that's not what you have to worry about. You don't have to worry about whether you're going to do the right thing or not. Hopefully, you're the kind of person that wants to do the right thing. What you have to prepare for is what can they lie about? And a lie usually isn't 100% a lie. There's like 5% or 10% that's true, and then they wrap a lie around it, and then they fall back to that one 5 or 10% to justify the rest. So yeah, there were things that I would do differently. So for example, we built, for all intents and purposes, a CRO in-house at Proof. We had a clinical operations team. We had a team of research assistants all across the United States. They were all credentialed and certified beyond what you would need to do as an NIH awardee and those type of things. And so one of the questions we had to answer was, well, why were you guys investing so much in research? Why did you have this research operation? Was it designed in some way to be sales or that type of thing? So I wouldn't do something like that again. Our IT team, we did all our software development in-house as well. I didn't know better. There wasn't a regulatory issue or anything like that. But again, what happened with regards to the government investigation, if the IT was different than the lab, which was different than the research, which was different where the IP was held and it was broken up in multiple different companies, I could have just replaced the lab with another and been in business. Another thing that as an entrepreneur, you may think, oh gosh, I don't want to raise a bunch of money because I don't want to get diluted or that type of thing. Huge mistake. Pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered, been slaughtered. Um, I didn't want to get diluted. I wanted to try to hold on as much of the company as I could, and so I funded it all myself. I'm a, I'm, I'm a son of an immigrant, you know, kind of old-fashioned. You save up and you minimize your debt and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so we had people offering us money hand over fist, and I didn't take it um, because I didn't want to get diluted. Big mistake. Should have had a big war chest nest egg because once you get to a point in time, people are going to come after you, and they're going to come after you in very, very dishonest ways. Um, and they have very powerful lobbyists in DC and those type of things, and so they can use the levers of the government, which is unlimited resources, to hurt you. So you've got to be prepared. So if you're going to play you know, in the big leagues, you've got to put your big boy pants on and do that type of thing, and you've got to raise that kind of capital to be able to do it. So there are a lot of, I mean, a lot of mistakes. I look back on all the shoulda, woulda, couldas, um, and hopefully we'll do a better job moving forward. When's the book coming out? <laughs> so I have my wife going through it right now because okay. um, you know, it's something that exposes a lot of the family yeah. stuff and that mm -hmm. type of thing. So once she's comfortable with it, it'll publish us here. Just a quick aside, when I wrote my article, the original title was, um, we just lost blank thousand dollars and boy is my wife pissed. And she's like, really, Joey? Do you have to tell them how much you lost? And I was like, okay, I'll put a lot of money. It's not as interesting, but fine. Uh, it's 
still got readership. If I'm not mistaken, you said that among your lessons learned were you would have outsourced more. Yeah, uh, definitely. I, I, we had so much everything. So much of everything we were doing was in house. Um, fortunately, we had you know legal opinions out the wazoo. Even though we had an internal legal group, we had you know marquee legal opinions all over the place. You know, legal review of every single thing we did. We had a lot of consultants review things. And I would say early stage as an entrepreneur, I honestly thought consultants were a waste of money. To be honest with you. I was like, why am I going to pay somebody to tell me something I already know? If you ever have to be investigated, it is wonderful to have a third-party expert tell you something you already know. Hmm. Because the government values that. They say, oh, you didn't just make the decision on those billing codes. You had an expert tell you that's what you should do. Fine. Because they're looking for intent. They're looking to say, did you come up with something that you have intention to do wrong? But if you rely upon a third party, even though you may say, oh, gosh, it's a waste of money. I already know this. Really, really valuable. Consultants and experts play a huge, huge role in that. And I definitely would have not had everything under one roof because when the legs got taken out, it all crumbled. Okay. Okay. My name is Gunjan Bagla and I'm a Gunjan, consultant. Nice to meet you. Uh, uh, really striking story. Uh, I have uh, two questions for you. Yeah. Number one, at any stage, did your board or others advise you to hire a crisis PR firm? And number two, do you think things would have turned out differently if it weren't for Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes? Um, answer to the second question, absolutely yes, because that created confirmation bias. Um, yeah, that's, that situation pissed me off so much. I mean, that lady raised so much money and never even had one freaking scientific poster to back up what she was doing. And the nerve of this guy in his first article to suggest that we were a Theranos with all the awards we had won and all the key opinion leaders. I was like, how many posters do you want? I got them come out my wazoo with all the different studies we've done. Um, but yes, I definitely think that's the case. Um, with regards to your first question around a crisis communications uh, firm, by the time we actually retained a crisis communication firm, it was too late. Um, one of the things, one of the lessons that I mentioned in my book is around basically planning for the never happen. So when you're going through scenario planning, I'm sure a lot of us have been trained in scenario planning, either in large companies or consulting firms or those type of things. And so if, if you think about scenario planning, there's certain situations that you kind of put off in a parking lot and say those things will never happen. Uh, the Boy Scout motto of being prepared is really, really important. And so we live in a world where things do move much faster than they used to. Um, and we absolutely thought about, you know, what would happen if a government investigation happened? We brought in McDermott, Will, and Emery. We paid them $220,000. And we said, okay, spend the next two months and pretend you're government investigators and go through everything just to make sure. Because when you're 278 employees, you don't really know everything that everybody's doing. And so let's just pretend. Let's go through this misery just to see what it was like, which was a year before this happened. Because I just wanted to know. I recommended to our board. I said, you know, I get paranoid about these things. I just, why don't we pretend? Which we did. We didn't prepare for lies. We just prepared that if the government was objective and came in and looked at things and went through all the evidence, would there be any evidence of wrongdoing? And when there were little tweaks on things like, ooh, that person said that over an email, that kind of sounds bad. Or like, oh, you know what, if we can get Hopkins to do a study with us, then maybe they'll use our technology in the future. Ooh, bad thing, don't say that in an email, even though everyone in the industry thinks that way. Can't say that because then it suggests that if we ever do research with Hopkins that there was intention for an inducement. So you find these things when you do an investigation and do forensics. And we paid McDermott well and Emory to do that. We, had, you know, we did this on a regular basis. Um, but we didn't plan for lies. And so now, kind of to your question, you don't necessarily say, we don't want to get close to the line. You don't want to say, we're going to keep distance away from the line. You want to keep distance away from the line, tell the world how far you are away from that line, and then say, gosh, how, what can people do to lie about us? And then let's prepare for that. So in the event something happens, you kind of come back really, really hard. And I don't know what your political persuasion is. I didn't vote for him. But Donald Trump is actually very, very good at this. He brings a machine gun to a knife fight every single time. Anytime somebody talks crap about him, he is pummeling them, pummeling them publicly, legally, et cetera, which is why he's somewhat Teflon to the accusations that are made around him. That approach is actually in the world, the media we live in now, honestly, the way you have to do it. You have to bring a machine gun to the knife fight. Otherwise, you're going to get killed. Oh, so in the interest of full disclosure, I was an investigative reporter. I was a former reporter of the newspaper. Um, and, and man, I'm sorry about what happened to you. Yeah, it's not. No, I'm John Eckberg. Um, you've heard the phrase malice of forethought. It uh -huh. strikes me that, I mean, not probably many people know about that little nuance, but right. it strikes me, one, you would have won hands down because he, he fabricated. Right. But, and, and two, the deep pockets are the newspaper. Correct. And Specifically three, the owner of the newspaper who owns the Boston yeah, Red Sox. Yeah, I'd love to own Fenway big, Park. Big, deep pockets. Yeah. But three, the question is, is would any of that matter? 
It's a great question. So I have belabored this because the guy that owns Stat News, his name is John Dorsey. He owns the Boston Red Sox. Statute of limitations in the state of Massachusetts is three years, so I technically can keep my powder dry for another few months um, and thought about whether I go after him or not. Then it's going to open up a lot of wounds. It's going to bring it all back into my life again. I'm going to have to deal with that. Um, and do I really want to deal with it or not? That's been the question for me. I should have done it right when it happened. Three years later, do I really want to go through that again? That's the question mark, whether it's worth it or not. Um, there is a tremendous amount of um, protection that's given to the media from a slander standpoint. And so when you read the article articles, he does a nice job of saying, well, the company alleged that he used, he used the passive voice. Um, so he pulls himself out as the noun, uses the passive voice. And then I think the most disingenuous thing in the world is you give somebody misinformation and you ask them to respond to that. And they say, oh, yeah, if a company is paying doctors to, to order testing, that's totally unethical. So this ethics expert at this university says this practice is unethical. Well, we're not doing that practice. And so he was able to do enough that we may or may not win the lawsuit, to be honest. So the only reason why I would do it is to trigger his liability insurance, to see if his liability insurance would just settle. But in all likelihood, he's going to make me have to zip my mouth and not talk about it. So I'd rather just tell the truth and hold him accountable that way. Since I lost in the court of public opinion, I'm going to appeal in the court of public opinion. Are there any other questions? Because I do, and I will unless there are any other hands. And I'm happy to talk with people outside. We don't have to do it with microphones. And you sure will. I'm sure that'll come up. So you've certainly shared a lot of learning. And if you're still as susceptible to me talking smack about you as soon as we leave this room. Yep. Is there a defense? Besides saying more bad stuff about me? Yeah, well, he's not credible. <laughs> right. Um, there are steps that you can take. Um, I, I outline it in the book. I've got... I've got kind of, I, I put all those pieces into place now for me. Um, so that in the event something like that happens again, I respond much more effectively. Um, but at the end of the day, unfortunately, we do live in a world where people can do that. And so someone could take pictures of this event and go post it on social media afterwards and say, any caption they want. Meshkin admits to breaking the law, which I didn't, but they could say it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it becomes he said, she said. Um, and then I would obviously, hopefully you guys video record it, and I would very quickly put it all out there and respond to it, rather than saying, oh, that's such garbage, I'm not gonna respond to it. If that were to happen, yeah. I would prefer if they said, Paige gets Meshkin. <laughs> <laughs> great thought, because that would be some great clicks. Ladies and gentlemen, Brian Meshkin. <laughs>